Hello, my name is Peggy Maddox and I'm from Kids on the Land. And we're so sorry that we're not going to get to meet you again this year because of the pandemic. But we thought we've got to figure out a way to connect with you and we decided we'd do some video presentations. Now, as you were not in school at this time last year, so we couldn't be with you, we did put some outdoor activities up on our website. Maybe you got to enjoy those. But let's think back to when you were third graders and we did get to meet you out on the Richards Ranch. We told you that Kids on the Land has a mission, a job. We want you to learn about the place where you live. Why do we think that's important? If you connect to the land, especially the land and your environment where you are, then you'll want to take care of it and to take care of a place and be willing to sustain it. We have to know about it. So let's think back what you might have learned as third graders. We talked about the fact that your county was named for the Jack brothers, Patrick and William who were soldiers in the war for Texas independence. They were heroes. We also talked about you're living in a certain eco region of Texas. Let's review that. Think the word eco region. Eco is from the Greek language, it means home. And region is an area of land or water that is similar may have the same climate or same plants, the same animals, or even same soils. So what ecoregion do you live in? There are 11 ecoregions in Texas, and your ecoregion is right along in this area right here. What do you think makes your ecoregion different from the other 10? Think about landscape in your area. Uh, you don't live near the ocean, do you? You don't live near a desert? No, you live in the Western Cross Timbers ecoregion. Now the Western Cross Timbers ecoregion is an area where you have open plains and areas of trees in a kind of a straight line. Now, when the Spanish explorers came and into this region, they saw that long stretch of trees so thick, and they said the wood was so hard that they called it the iron cast forest. Maybe your grandmother has an iron cast skillet. You know how hard they are. So your region, your eco-region, say this, I live in the Western Cross Timbers eco-region. Now, let's see if we can learn some more about the place where you live. Let's look at some history of this eco region. Now, I've made a timeline of events that have occurred over thousands and thousands of years here. Do you know what a timeline is? If I made a timeline of your life, I'd probably start with the year you were born, then I might add the year you started school, then maybe the year you started playing baseball. So it's a series of events in a sequence. Oh, events that happened millions of years ago up to today. So let's go have a look at some of the history. 70 million years ago, this area was covered by a shallow sea. There was no dry land, there was no river. 12,000 years ago, at the end of the Ice Age, the first rivers appeared. And as the weather got warmer, the ice began to melt. And as the glaciers melted, this provided the water for the rivers to develop. 
winds blew soils, and the prairie lands began to develop. The first human footprints on this, were on this land, and they were the Paleo Indians. If you had been nine or 10 years old, 12,000 years ago, you might have been living along the banks of the Brazos or Trinity Rivers. There was grass and water, trees and valleys, food for animals and protection for man. The banks of these rivers were a good place to camp. 12,000 years ago, your people probably would have hunted the mammoths like this one. And you would have butchered the mammoth with your stone tools. 1,000 years ago, the footprints of the Native American Indians appeared on this land. They were the descendants of the Paleo Indians. If you had been nine or 10 years old, 1,000 years ago, your family would have been part of small bands of Indians who hunted the buffalo on foot with spears and bows and arrows. Your family would have camped along the Brazos or Trinity River, the rivers again providing water, shelter, and food. 500 years ago, if you were nine or 10 years old and you were a young Comanche Indian child, you might have looked in amazement at the Spanish explorer, Coronado, who visited this area. You would have been excited to see a man riding a horse. You had never seen a horse. Your people would have learned to ride horses and become the rulers of the plains. The buffalo herds provided all that the Indian tribes needed to survive on these plains. 245 years ago, a Frenchman, De Misere, was likely the first European to see this land. He led an expedition for the Spanish to map and explore the area. Around 185 years ago, in 1832, a Spanish military man named Jose Maurice led an expedition across this area while seeking a suitable route to connect Santa Fe in what is now New Mexico to the Spanish forts in South Texas. About this time, 500 to 600 trappers and hunters had ventured into North Texas to trade and barter with the Indians. Around 160 years ago in 1855, Jacksboro was established. A year later, 1856, Jack County was formed and named for Patrick and William Jack, Patriots of the Texas Revolution. At this time, the white settlers who came were looking for free rangelands to raise their cattle. Jack County was a borderland between Caddo Indians to the east and Comanche, Tonkawa, and Wichita Indians to the west. Until this time, the area was home of Indians and wildlife. You, as a young Indian child 166 years ago, you would have watched as your tribe grew more hostile as they tried to defend their hunting ground. It was at this time that James Henry Hensley and his wife, Eliza Elizabeth, and baby boy came to Jack County to homestead in the southern part of the newly formed Jack County. Their land in the southern part of the county along East Keechai Creek was open grassland and great for running their cattle. The Hensley family descendants are the Richards family today. That includes John Hackley, Brent Hackley, and Martha Salmon. Other early settlers were Harve Roselle, Moses Dameron, Hensley brothers, William and John. Five years later in 1861, the Texas and the U.S. government tried to make the Indians go to the Indian reservations that had been established on the frontier. The food of the Plains Indians depended on the large buffalo herds that roamed the plains. The buffalo hunters who had been coming to this area for the last 25 years were killing the large herds of buffalo that had lived on the plains for centuries. The Plains Indians were left with no choice but to go to the Indian reservations in order to survive. Around 150 years ago, if you had been a young Indian child, nine or 10 years old, you and your family might have been living on one of the Texas Indian reservations. Your tribe might have been moved to the Brazos Indian Reservation near Fort Belknap. 
Does anyone know who this man is? Before the Civil War, this famous general, Robert E. Lee, lived here on the plains and was in charge of the Indian reservations, and he tried to keep peace between the Indians and settlers. When the Civil War began in 1861, General Robert E. Lee and the other soldiers at the forts left to fight in the Civil War. The Indians felt they were free to return to their hunting lands. The Indians on the reservations were glad to see the white men fighting each other in the Civil War that was going on in the eastern part of the United States. That meant they were free to return to their attacks on the settlers left in Jack County. With most soldiers withdrawn for fighting in the east, the frontier was more or less undefended and the Indians could raid at leisure. Texas, one of their traditional hunting grounds, was a particularly attractive target. But then, in 1868, the Civil War was over, and Fort Richardson was built three miles from the little settlement of Jacksboro to, be, to help with the Indian problems on the frontier. If you were nine or ten years old when Fort Richardson was built, you might have moved with your family to live at the fort. Your father would have been part of the 10th United States Cavalry stationed at the fort. The soldiers of Fort Richardson maintained the fort, helped local law officers keep the peace, pursued criminals and deserters, escorted wagon trains, oversaw elections, protected cattle herds, and most importantly, patrolled for Indians. The presence of the fort at Jacksboro made the settlers in Jack County feel safer as the Indian attacks continued. The Indians would leave the reservations in Oklahoma to raid in North Texas. Huddled in their cabins on moonlit nights or always on the watch, they worked their gardens and herded their cattle. Indian attack was always on the Jack County settlers' mind. At the fort, as a nine or 10 year old child, you might have heard the story of how Ma Dodson, the Hackley family ancestor, saved her children from an Indian raid by hiding them under the floor in her cabin and then riding away toward Fort Richardson with the Indians in a wild chase after her. This happened not far from the Richards Ranch. 146 years ago, 1871, the wagon train massacre occurred. If you had been a youngster, nine or 10 years old, living in Jack County about 146 years ago, you probably heard of a trial of two Comanche Indian chiefs, Big Tree and Santanta. This was the first time an Indian chief had been tried by a white man's court. Just imagine, if you were nine or 10 years old, Around 140 years ago, you might have been traveling with your family to cross the Western Cross Timbers. As you traveled in your covered wagon, you might have met Mr. Reverchon, a naturalist who came to this area and collected plants. Today, his collections of plants is considered one of the greatest in the world and can be found in Dallas. Four years later, the Indians had been subdued, subdued and if you were the Comanche Indian child, nine or 10 years old, you knew that life on the Texas Plains was over. The soldiers had finally convinced the Indian tribes in North Texas that they must return to the lands set aside for them in Oklahoma. The buffalo were gone, but in 1876, great herds of cattle moved through this area on the Western Cattle Trails. If you had been a young white settler's child, nine or 10 years old, you might have wished you could go on one of those cattle drives to the railhead in Kansas. In 1877, it was about this time that a group of cattlemen got together and began organizing a cattle association, the headquarters of what became known as the Texas Cattle Raisers Association was on the Loving Ranch here in Jack County. In 1880, around 137 years ago, turbulent times came back for the settlers in Jack County. If you had been a young child in Jack County in those years, you might have heard of a new invention. The ranchers who wanted their cattle to roam freely, the farmers who were coming to claim a homestead wanted to grow crops. 
The rancher's cattle roamed freely and destroyed the farmer's crops. Cattlemen wanted their large cow herds to graze the grass wherever they wanted to go. But about this time, a new invention came to the plains. The farmers began to put up barbed wire fences around their land. Cattlemen made life hard for the early farmers who were trying to farm. The cattlemen would cut the new barbed wire fences, and that's when the barbed wire war erupted. It didn't last long because in 1884, a law was passed that made it illegal to cut a barbed wire fence. Around 119 years ago, if you'd been nine or 10 years old, in Jacksboro, you probably heard oil was discovered just 10 miles from Jacksboro on the Stenhouse property, and oil activity has continued until this day. Also, 119 years ago, if you were 9 or 10 years old living in Jacksboro, your parents might have let you go down to see the Chicago, Rock Island, and Texas Railway as it came to Jacksboro. The county began to grow and prosper as access to new markets came when the railroad arrived. Almost 110 years ago, if you'd been a 9 or 10 year old child in Jack County, you might have become a member of the Corn Club. Mr. Marks, the county agent, held a corn show and was disappointed that the farmers did not support it. He decided to start getting the young people interested in improving farming practices. He organized what he called the Corn Club. The Corn Club idea developed into the 4-H program we have today. And I bet many of you know about 4-H. When farming began to lose favor with Jack County residents because of drought, grasshopper plagues, and eroding oil, Jack County became more a cattle country, which it has remained to this day. 1950, more than 67 years ago, the Lost Creek Reservoir was constructed. Lost Creek Reservoir is still providing water for Jacksboro today. Then in 2015, the super shark fossils were found at the Lost Creek Reservoir. The shark at the top of this poster was giant. He was 27 foot long and he lived in the sea that covered this land 200 million years ago. The shark at the bottom of the picture is a normal sized shark we see today. Seven years ago in 2014, Kichai Wind Energy came here. For over a decade, wind farms had been sprouting all over Texas, making the Lone Star State the nation's leader in wind energy. One of the newest, a 15,000 acre wind farm, is now operating in Jack County, just outside of Jacksboro. And as a nine or 10 year old today, you can see some of those turbines on the Richards Ranch and on other places around Jacksboro. And if we were able to be with you today, we would be standing on the land that belongs to the Hackley family. That family has a long connection to the Jack County history in this timeline. Jack County was known as the Mother County of the West in the early years of settlement here. You are part of that colorful history of your county. As you look back over this timeline and know that you are part of a hearty people who came to stay no matter how difficult it was going to be. Until we can be with you again at the Richards Ranch after this pandemic, we hope you will remember you are connected to this land and its history. This world starting right with